Okay, so that's a nice question to transition us into a discussion of learning. So gradient of descent, and we already talked, you know, loss function, you know, something combining, uh, you know, your normal error along with a count of the inconsistent neurons, which are equivalent to functions. Okay, so find parameters W and beta, they must be set in a way such as the classical outcomes on classical uh, on the on the operators looks like it's with the classical operator. And also, we want to have this fit with some level of interpretability. And that's why the beta term, which is a bias that's sort of tacked onto those operators, ends up being really difficult to interpret. Weights associated with each of the inputs to an operator, you have some kind of intuition. It's like, hey, that operator that is doing A and B, and the A input has a higher weight than the B, okay, maybe it's thinking A is somehow more important. But what, what does the bias mean in that case? It's really quite annoying when you think about it. You're doing all this work for explainability, and you have this term, you know, no one quite sure what it means. Now, here's the thing. Because of uh, a logical structure, the correct way to frame this optimization problem is with constraints, okay? So we can, you know, so we frame this as an optimization problem with constraints because we want to force those parameters to be behave in a way where our stuff on classical input gives classical outputs. Okay. Well, that should be a big flag to you know all you deep learning folks in the audience because you know there's not really a great way to do this with gradient descent. So also they talk about how um, and the loss function again, but okay, what goes on here, if you do try to solve this, the, you know, a technique used in a lot of optimizations to introduce slack variables, do stuff iteratively, change the values of the slack variables. So you try to get the slack around the constraints to be as tight as possible. So it's more or less meeting the constraints. And if you look in the optimization literature, they have like, you know, especially like integer programming stuff, they'll have like approximation results around, um, you know, some epsilon that's associated with the slack variable because you're not quite meeting the constraint. So you have that. So that's like, well, that's not too, you know, exciting. And then, you know, parameter updates at each, uh, at each iteration of gradient descent you got to solve this constraint satisfaction problem. So well, that, you know, that doesn't sound very pleasant. And then, like I said about beta, well, beta can lead to overfitting, they said. Um, I'll kind of take their word for it. It seems to be, you know, something that would occur. And also you have a beta for each neuron in this setup, and that leads to this interpretability issue. You have this crazy parameter that can overfit and you don't know what it means. That's like, you know, really bad. So they said, well, hey, we can address this in a really cool way by the activation function. And that's what they call the tailored activation function. And so this is how they define it. It, it gets classical outputs on classical inputs. Um, and then you have these values xf and xt. And remember when I said we don't want to just rely on alpha, we'll talk about xf and xt. The nice thing here that I think was a really cool outcome uh, of this is that they maintain the classical inputs and outputs regardless of what the weights are set to. Uh, and so the weights, like I said earlier, they're just kind of adjusting how that curve looks. And also they say, hey, it's independent of B, and we define B as a, uh, for a given operator as some of the weights associated with that. So this is back to our uh, activation function. But now we've added in uh, alpha, we have one minus alpha, and we have that space in between. And then when we 
uh, look at the domain which goes into the activation function. And so notice here it's two at the maximum. That's because here we're looking at something that is like a conjunction of two variables. Okay, so the max value will be two. So this is the domain here is just going to be the same as the, uh, um, the number of inputs. And so then you have XF and XT, which allows you to essentially that's where you're boxing in this uncertainty. And so um, based, so they look at how those can be set based on the tailored activation function. Um, and you can adjust these things in a way where you can have, hey, I have an application where I need really high precision. Maybe I want stuff adjusted to look like this. I'm okay with accepting this giant uncertainty region because I'm only going to say I'm going to set a very high alpha because I want to be really certain. I'm looking to, you know, um, identify a, a stock I want to invest. I don't need all of them. I just need like one or two good ones. But you might have a different application where you'll accept more error because maybe you're looking at something like a cancer diagnosis. So maybe you have the alpha could be a little lower. I have a question. Sure. Um, how do you set up the X, XM and X? Is there a, like a crossover between like uh, the first red box and the between the blue box? I mean, I'm just wondering like how do you set up those boxes? I mean, X, 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 X. They come right to the front ones. X up and then Y up is just one line itself. Sure. So uh, in the upward and the downward pass, um, the upward pass, when you do the upward pass, you basically tighten the bounds for the entire formula, right? But uh, this they say in the paper that when you do the downward pass, they are retightening the bounds for the atoms. Right. What does that uh, help in? I mean, is it like an iterative? So yeah, because because what will happen is is that you know so like I said, if you have like A and B, and that is annotated with point A, comma one, and then below I have A, and it was initially annotated with point five, comma one, I know that that's got to get updated, and it's going to be at least point eight, comma one, right? And then maybe there's some other formula that A is in over here that that annotation changes on the next pass. And that's that's why. And the convergence criteria is, is simple. It's just when the bounds don't change to certain delta. So but they they prove in the paper that it converges in a finite number of steps. Um, you know, likely that's going to be dependent on the number of bits used to represent this. Anyway, back to uh, learning. So, so you know, seeing that visual and why I put that in there, like that's what you're learning. You're learning what those regions are going to be for everything in the knowledge base. So that's a really important thing to keep in mind when considering if you want to use this paradigm, because you know what you can think of. You know, here would be an interesting use case for LNMs. Let's say I have my favorite rule learning, you know, algorithm like FOIL or, or a priori, right? I learn a whole bunch of rules. Well, of course, that's not going to fit to the data. I want to make it fit the data. I can take those that set of rules from the rule learning algorithm, and then I can throw it in here. It'll construct the network, sign weights to all the operators. And now I, I get out of it. I have rules with these operators uh, that have associated weights. And then I can do inference based on what I trained that model on. But again, keep in mind that I would only expect it to do well on stuff that was in the training data. If there's formulas or things that are outside the training data, you know, yeah, you, you're going to get some, it'll probably be okay maybe in the classical case, but the um, fuzzy case, I think, would be, uh, I wouldn't count on that because it was parameters weren't designed for that. So, loss function includes the measurement of inconsistency. And 
This is what happened in some of their experiments. They get this oscillation, okay, um, which is really interesting. Like, why does that? Why do you get that oscillation uh, when it gets close to convergence? And I'll tell you why. And they they talk about this in the paper. Let's say my error is can be minimized in weights assigned two different ways. Okay, I have two different assignments of weights that minimize error. I'll say, I'll just call them W1 and W2, okay? So W1 gives atom A a one, one, and it gives, you know, a not A, also a one, one. Meanwhile, it gives atom B one one, and it gives atom not B zero zero. Okay, so those are all the outputs I care about in this toy example. One in, or two inconsistencies. One two. All right. Weight assignment two. It gives atom A one one. It gives not A zero zero. It gives B, let's say, zero, zero, and it gives not B, also zero, zero. Again, I have two inconsistencies. But remember, I said both these have the same like MSE. So that's why you get this. It's just bouncing between, you know, two different types of inconsistencies. Yeah. I know what the error is reducing, right? So this is escaping now. The oscillation. Well, though, yeah, but it's the point is, is that it always it'll it'll do this oscillation, and as it improves the error, but it still is going to be oscillating. And I would argue that, you know, probably in this case, the logic is such that you can't possibly avoid the inconsistency based on the training data. Like there's like this one sample where it gets a flip flop or something. Yeah, well, I'm kind of curious like, the way they handle the loss, like. It almost seems like the consistency would be like it's unconstrained or something. Like whereas they just kind of add it, we don't really discuss that. They they talk about it a little bit in the supplemental material, and I was I was kind of hard to see it because I was initially bothered by having consistency be part of the loss because you know I mean I come from you know logic background and like if you have an inconsistency and you don't know the extent of it, like you throw the whole thing away, right? But there's two things to know about it. One, it's not inconsistency by atom, it's inconsistency by each item in the, semant in the syntactical tree, which I think is a little bit better. You have an idea of kind of how it affects things you care about. And two, they also do say in the paper, they say, hey, this is just one way to do it. They do mention that something like, hey, in gradient descent, you can not set the weights anytime an inconsistency comes up or something like that. They don't actually do it, but they do. Yeah, and I guess it also just seems like um, maybe it's like a multi objective problem, right? They kind of have these two objectives, but also, like, um, I wonder like, if there are other ways they could formulate like, the optimization criteria. Um, like, it seems kind of arbitrary that they chose to make this one to add this one and then ignore the other constraints, I guess, or like not true. The other constraints aren't constraint. being ignored. Do you remember the other constraints they had were to force things to act classically on classical inputs. And they addressed the problem with the tailored activation function. So but they, don't, they don't use like a constraint optimization. So I think they did when they tested out the before they did the tailored activation because they didn't show results, but they said certain things that kind of hinted that they tried it. So, um, you know, but I think to to enforce logical constraints, one way to do it would be to solve a constraint satisfaction problem on each iteration. You know, I, I don't think I'd recommend that because that would be, you know, that would take a while. But um, anyhow.